for this lovely introduction. Yes, uh, I am extremely happy. Is this working well enough? Yes. Um, to uh, congratulate you all for uh, the inauguration of Neuropsy. It's a wonderful building. There are huge opportunities. Um, there are huge opportunities for collaboration, as you mentioned as well. So uh, I'll just show an image of uh, Neurospin, if it works. Maybe it will. Something to do? Yes. So uh, we're just next door, 50 meters from each other, sharing the same canteen uh, in many ways. So I think we can enjoy uh, life together. You know that at Neurospin, there are many tools that could be useful to you. So I would just like to advertise for a moment. We have three human scanners. And I will talk a lot about human and animal parallels that could be investigated. I think cross-species comparisons is one of the very exciting domains. Um, but in particular, we have this huge scanner at 11.7 Tesla, which is the world's biggest. And here it's shown a few years ago when it's just being shipped, but now it's installed, it's working. It will generate images. In fact, we got permission to scan humans, and this is just starting now. So expect some interesting science in monkeys and humans uh, from this scanner. And then we have three animal scanners, and many of you are already collaborating, in particular with Luisa Siobanu uh, and Sebastian, uh, who are uh, helping with the um, access to these scanners. And it's possible to scan rodents and perhaps other species. I know there, uh, there is a starting project on fish which is interesting, uh, but why not also marmosets? I think it would be extremely interesting to uh, develop this. And of course, we also uh, don't do just MRI, but also uh, behavior, electro, magnetoencephalography. And uh, we want to develop more uh, the non-human primate electrophysiology and not just fMRI. I will show you some examples where that we can get from MRI, but uh, we would like to have more. I consider it's extremely important that people in Neurospin do not consider that the brain is made of voxels. There is a strong temptation when you do MRI to think that the brain is made of voxels, but the brain is made of cells. And uh, we need to keep that in mind and record from the actual cells, the neurons, and of course, keep in mind the glia as well. Um, uh, there is also enormous computational ability. I know there is wonderful work here as well, but uh, to simulate the brain and to uh, basically analyze these images, in particular with the help of INRIA, uh, we are co-developers uh, Neurospin teams are co-developers of tools uh, to analyze brain data, to map it, to decode it, and I will make use of that in my talk. So the question I want to raise today is a very big one. Why are we the only species to create symbol systems? What you see here could only be done by humans. If you go to Lascaux, you see these beautiful uh, paintings of animals, which are already abstracted away from nature. Uh, but also you see a rectangle or a line of dots. Nobody knows what they mean, but they have structure to them. And I will talk about this structure. We produce uh, systems of mathematics, of music, of written spoken languages with enormous amounts of structure. We produce uh, landscape art or buildings that have architecture. And all of these have enormous regularities which are symbolic in nature. And uh, I would like to ask whether we can understand the origins of this uh, system. Um, in my past work, I looked a lot at uh, what's common between uh, human brains and other brains. And in particular, uh, I think we may agree that we share a lot with other animal species. First of all, we share uh, a system for conscious reflection planning, which I've called the Global Neuronal Workspace, and uh, Peter will talk a lot about that, Peter Rufsema, but the mechanisms of ignition seem to be similar in humans and in other animals. We also share a lot of core knowledge systems. Uh, I studied number, but also concepts of space, probabilities, objects, visual representations uh, are shared largely between human and non-human primates. So what's special that was afforded by this enormous expansion of the human brain? What I speculate is that we discretize these concepts. We use tokens in our heads, symbols, and the symbols are first of all in our heads, but then we can communicate them with others. And it's not just that we assign symbols, but we recombine them. We have a grammar. 
And this grammar generates an infinite number of nested thoughts. So suddenly the space of possible thought expands dramatically. It's perhaps the same mechanism of consciousness, but what you and I can be conscious of is much richer than what other animals can be conscious of because of this grammar of concepts. So there are two key properties that I would like to talk about. The first one is symbol assignment. We attach a symbol, internal or external, to any concept in both directions. And the second property is symbol composition. What we mean actually by a symbol is just not one isolated sign, but it's a system of signs that combine together to form uh, propositions, expressions in the language of thought. So we'll try to document both aspects and to show you that we can have paradigms that are simple enough to study these things in monkeys, in humans, and why not in collaboration with you in other animals as well. Um, so this is the general view that I would like to defend. That it's not just one language system, it's multiple languages. There are all these parallel networks in the human brain. Some of them are really for natural language, phonology, syntax, semantics, but others are for mathematics or music or space. They are partially overlapping, partially dissociable. They are parallel with each other, and they all have these properties of discretizing concepts and assigning them symbols that compose recursively. So if you're interested in this idea, we just published a paper in TICS recently to explain more about the, this hypothesis. Um, so let me start with the first property, symbolic assignment. How is the brain of little Jesus here able to acquire the word lapin? Because his mother, Mary, is telling him, you know, the word lapin in this beautiful painting by Titian. Um, so it may come to a surprise to you that uh, we think that animals do not use symbols because there are all these experiments where animals have learned uh, lexigrams. Uh, chimpanzees could learn some uh, hundreds of such lexigrams, also dogs. And you see these incredible experiments, like this is the one by Matsuzawa, where uh, an animal is able to point to the Arabic numeral corresponding to a quantity. And if you look carefully, it's the proper Arabic numeral for the quantity, which is on the left here. Uh, and maybe even better than you might be in this task without training. Um, so don't these monkeys understand symbols? Well, there are several things here. The first thing is that there is no evidence for composition. It's still debated, but the people who have analyzed this show that there is memory for specific sequences, but no real syntactic composition. But even more basic, perhaps, there is this property of reversibility. If I show you something in the sky and I say this is a plane, and you look up and you see the plane, you go from the word to the object, but the next time you see the object, you're going to be able to evoke, to evoke the word. So you have a reversible attachment, one of the most basic properties of symbols. If you want to communicate, we need to have it both ways. But it's, it's not clear that animals have this at all. And for instance, uh, this uh, animal was actually trained in both directions separately because, and there is a nice experiment by Matsuzawa, uh, he did not reverse uh, the association. Um, so we recently uh, set up an experiment to study this in monkeys and humans uh, with Timo and all the authors listed here, Gislaine. Uh, the idea is very simple. We're going to show an object, new object like this one here. And after a little while, short, uh, less than one second, we give a label like the word bunyunyu. Um, and uh, this is what we call the canonical order. For certain objects, it's object first, label second. For others, it's the vice versa. Then we're going to test whether you know this association. And the way to test that is by surprise. Do you get the reaction when we present you the incongruent label on a rare occasion, maybe 10% of trials, you'll see the wrong label. You should react if you know the label by saying, no, this is the wrong one, I am surprised. But then we are also going to test in the non-canonical order. And this is testing reversibility. We present these two types of trials equally often. The word is presented first, and then you get either the congruent picture or the incongruent picture. But in this, in this order, you've never been trained. Are you going to be surprised if you get the incongruent picture? And we're going to look at this at the whole brain uh, because previous experiments have only used behavior. And of course, behavior may not reflect the full set of computations that are going on in the brain. So we use fMRI to look at this. This is the full design. We have two object label pairs that are in the visual to auditory direction and two that are in the opposite direction. Uh, so four pairs in total. They are trained for three days and in monkeys even more. And um, then we scan the monkeys while they have 70% of the congruent trials and 10% of the other trial types. And we check for surprise reaction. Uh, 
And we do this with fMRI. It's, uh, it's a three Tesla fMRI. Um, you can see here the quality of the data, which also illustrates an interesting point. We can dissociate visual and auditory activations, even though they are separated by 700, 800 milliseconds. Um, people forget that fMRI has temporal resolution. It's not perfect, but when it comes to telling the order of two activations, we can do it. So here you can see that VA, visual auditory, and auditory visual trials can be separated in both the visual cortex and the auditory cortex and in both species, which shows you that we have good quality fMRI data, basically. Um, so this being said, uh, does the surprise reaction work? So um, in humans, it's very beautiful and clean. We have surprise reaction to the incongruent label in both the canonical order as well as in the reversed non-canonical order. And you see the overlap of these reactions. They are shown in green here, the intersection of these activations. You see a very broad circuit is sensitive to this uh, symbolic attachment properties in both directions. Um, uh, you can see uh, inferior frontal activation and also language areas of the uh, superior temporal sulcus here in the left hemisphere, but notice that the network is very bilateral and it goes into the uh, uh, orbital uh, cortex and anterior insula, as well as the middle frontal gyrus, so outside of language areas. So it's a very broad network, also the intraparietal sulcus here. Multiple sites have this property of reversible attachment and surprise when it's not uh, in the proper assignment. Uh, monkeys are completely different. In monkeys, we see only the reaction to the incongruent label, which is important because it says the monkeys know what is the correct label, but they only know it in the canonical direction. They don't reverse, and so there is no reversal activation whatsoever. Uh, and you see these activations are also in different areas. They're primarily in uh, visual and auditory areas in the posterior part of the brain, uh, suggesting they are just uh, sensory associations, but not symbolic associations. We replicated the whole experiment because you might object that words are not a great stimulus for monkeys. So we also tried visual, visual association using symbols that are more like the lexigrams that uh, chimpanzees have been trained with in the past. So you see now object to lexigram association or vice versa. Same exact design. Uh, monkeys were also uh, incited to pay more attention because perhaps they just didn't attend. So here they get a reward for some of these objects. And we could see that this works because they have more activation to these. In particular, they have activation in the prefrontal cortex, the left hemisphere, a little bit in the right here in this second experiment. And for the learned association, we still see that they care and they react to the violation of this learned association. But they have zero generalization, unlike humans, when we reverse the association. And therefore, this creates, it's not just a null finding, it's a significant interaction in the brain of the monkey uh, between forward and reverse, suggesting that really they treat these two trials differently. So even in this extremely basic level, which is attachment of a symbol to an object, we already differ, I would claim. We already have generalization in a way that uh, other animals, in this case, macaque monkeys, uh, do not. It's a very fundamental property. It's not sufficient to define a symbol, but it is necessary, I think, to define a symbol. And we also got that in behavior, by the way. This is a little bit interesting. Uh, if you just ask subjects here, how frequently do you think that this particular sequence was presented? And then you present all of the four possible types of sequences. Subjects know that the congruent was presented more frequently, but they also have the illusion that the congruent but reversed has been presented almost equally often. And this is completely wrong. It was just presented 10% of the time. So they don't even remember what was the order. And if I ask you, you know, in which order did you first see the plane and the word plane, you have no idea whatsoever, even on one trial. Uh, you just associate. It's wrong. It's logically wrong, by the way. If A, then B, if B, there is no conclusion, right? So it's a sort of additional property that we bring because we want to have symbols. Okay, so now I want to move to the second part, which is about composition. Not only do we 
produce and attach symbols, but we compose them to create these amazing designs. For instance, the spiral or the zigzag, which you can see in various archaeological sites throughout the planet, by the way, universally across many cultures. Um, so we began to study this with a very simple paradigm, which is a sequence learning paradigm. Suppose I show you a sequence on screen. There are eight possible locations, and we'll show you a sequence of lengths eight going through these locations. And you have to decide how it's going to continue. Here it's presented to a preschooler, so I hope it's okay for you as well. Try to predict where the little fish is going next. Can you tell where it's going next? I bet you can, and you can complete the sequence, right? And everybody agrees. And if I show you the wrong sequence, you sort of shout up, it's not right. Could be any sequence, right? But you immediately picked up on the regularity. This is not even one trial learning, it's 0 0.5 trial learning, right? Uh, or zero shot or 0 0.5 shot, as they call it in AI. You immediately see the regularity. And we've tested a lot of these sequences and tested them in various ways. Can you remember? Can you predict what comes next? Can you detect if there is a violation? We always get the same results that the sequences that are uh, irregular, that they have no particular regularity, are almost impossible to learn on a one trial because they say when it's a length eight, it's, be, it's above classical measures of working memory for one trial. But the sequences can be remembered if they have regularity. And in order to explain what we mean by regularity, we have to have a language, a sort of programming language that, for instance, calls what you have seen on the screen, a zigzag, as a sort of mental program that says repeat four times, that I'm going to repeat two times a horizontal symmetry. So I do a symmetry, I start again, I do another one and another one and another one. That's one way to describe this zigzag. If you don't have such a language, you cannot capture the sort of regularities. And the language requires a list of primitives, symmetries and rotations, and a single rule of repetition of repetition with embedding, with recursion, which is a key property of human languages. So how can we prove this? I'm just going to show you one slide uh, with various experiments. First, behavior. For instance, your ability to anticipate on the next item, even without any instruction, I just tell you, follow with your eyes the sequence. No memory whatsoever. But if you do that, subjects do not just follow. They actually anticipate. And they anticipate, as you can see here, more and more as the complexity of the sequence is low. And what do we mean by complexity? We mean Kolmogorov complexity or minimal description length, uh, which is how compact how compressed is the program? The characteristic of human memory is that we don't just stick to the sequence, we actually compress it if there are regularities, a bit like a zip file. Um, and um, you see that the compression factor here explains which sequences we can anticipate and which we cannot. And if we move at the brain level, we can see a whole network being modulated by this measure of complexity. You can see a typical pattern of climbing of activity as the sequence gets more and more complex, and then dropping out for the more complex ones because you, they cannot be remembered very well. They cannot be coded, basically. This is the more complex one. Um, and uh, we've also been able to show with MEG, MEG allows you to track in real time, millisecond by millisecond, what's happening during such a sequence. Then we could tell that the sequence is being parsed according to the proposed program for the language of thought. So our program, for instance, predicts that there will be groupings by two, like in the, the one you saw for segments or zigzag, it's groupings by two. But for other sequences, for instance, if I draw uh, one arc and then another arc, or if I draw a square and then another square, the groupings will be by four. And we can see in the spectrum of the MEG without going into the details. We can see the spectrum of MEG, the proposed groupings. We can also decode the geometrical primitives that are postulated for symmetry and rotation and the number. Here, what you can see is the decoding of the proposed number of the item within a subgroup. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. There is nothing in the stimulus that says one, two, three, four. But in the mind of the subject, there is an implicit encoding of these sort of groups, right? So in this way, we can sort of validate uh, this idea. And very interestingly, the network which is involved in MRI is not the language network. If we ask what is the intersection between the areas for natural language and geometry, which I just showed you in yellow, there's very little overlap. The language areas are silent or even deactivated 
during this sort of task. The areas that are activated are much more similar to the ones that are involved in mathematics. There is a sort of language of mathematics implicit in this task. You see it's very bilateral and very, very active during these spatial tasks. So this is one of the reasons to postulate multiple languages. Even without being able to tell what is the regularity, you know what is the mental program. Can monkeys do this? We've tried very hard, and Leaping Wang was the instrument of these wonderful experiments. He was in Eurospin for, uh, I think, five years, and then he went back to the uh, Institute of Neuroscience in Shanghai, where he's now doing even more beautiful experiments. So what he has been able to do is train monkeys to actually remember a sequence and reproduce it. Um, it either forward or even in mirror image. What you can see here is the monkey getting a sample sequence and then reproducing it with the finger uh, in the reverse order. And actually there is a cue that tells him to do forward or reverse and he can do both. So monkeys can remember sequences and um, they can go all the way to length four. They can generalize to uh, new sequences that are organized. I think we'll see that in a second. If they are organized not as a little circle like this, but uh, as a pyramid, the monkey gets that for the first time and is able to do the sequence in reverse order. For those of you who are into uh, grammar, this is important because it's essentially a center embedding grammar. ABC becomes CBA. So it's similar to the center embedded sentences of language. And it's been argued that monkey should not be able to do that according to the Chomsky hierarchy. This is a high level embedded structure. So monkeys can do this. But what they cannot do is interesting. First of all, the sequence lengths in our hands at least cannot exceed three or four items. We cannot go to eight, they can't do it. After four, it begins really to be almost impossible for them. Learning is extraordinarily slow. It takes tens of thousands of trials of training to get this sort of behavior. And they don't seem to grab anything about the geometrical structures, unlike us who care about zigzags and so on. One way to show this is to classify the patterns that they are learning. For instance, it's very clear that one of the simplest ones, perhaps the simplest program for humans, is just to go around the circle. This is what we call plus one power four. You just go around the circle four times. And uh, there are 12 different versions of these, depending on where you start. But conceptually, they're all the same. I just go around the circle, right? Well, what happens is that we humans have very little within pattern variation. So we don't distinguish those 12, but we distinguish them from, let's say, a pattern where it crosses like this. And so we have a lot of between pattern variation. Monkeys have exactly the reverse. They have all sorts of idiosyncrasies about where we start, how close the items are, and so on, but they don't really have systematic between pattern variation. And I hope you can see this here, which is the probability of success. It's been ranked across the 30 possible patterns according to the performance of children, but you see that adults actually behave very much the same, and they all, for instance, find this going around the circle the simplest. We all do. Uh, monkeys do not care at all. For them, it's all flat. The sequences are essentially all the same. There are four locations to remember. Um, in a very, very beautiful work that was published in science last year and to which I was associated, uh, Leaping Wang was able to record from prefrontal cortex and understand how these sequences are encoded. Uh, what he did was have monkeys remember three locations successively presented, and then after a delay, uh, the monkey would have to make saccades to each of these three locations. And he recorded with uh, two photon calcium imaging the prefrontal cortex during the delay period. And so uh, several thousands of cells contributing to this task. And he was able, I don't have time to explain in more detail, but he was able to show that this very large neural space of several thousand dimensions could be reduced to two rank two subspaces. There is a subspace in this neuronal space for the first location, the first element of the sequence, rank one. There's another one for the second element of the sequence, and there's one for the third. And each of them is organized according to the stimulus. It essentially records where the location was for this ordinal position one, ordinal position two, and ordinal position three. And you can account for all of the memory of the monkey, including the errors on specific trials, single trial analysis and decoding, by this very simple mathematical model of three dimension two 
subspaces. And what it shows is that it's essentially three slots. It's just three slots, memory slots, where you store these three locations. But there is no structure. There is no grammar. There is no compression. There doesn't seem to be any taking into account of the relationships, the geometrical relations between these locations, whether they form, let's say, a square or something like that. So um, our temporary conclusion is that monkeys do not care about geometry. They care, they can remember spatial locations, but they have no notion of geometry. In work in the lab, we've been trying to ask uh, whether this generalizes to uh, the auditory modality. So, of course, in language, we are much more used to having sequences in the auditory modality. And the question is, do we have exactly the same sense of regularity? So I'm going to test you, and this will wake you up, uh, even better than coffee. Uh, see if you can remember this sequence here. It's going to be 16 items. All right? Are you ready? What do you think? More or less, yes? Good, good. I can see some of you are, are reproducing it. Let's try another one. I think you picked it up, right? Did you see that it was repeated? There was the first eight and another eight that was the same. And inside there were two pairs and two and four alternations, something like that. Let's try another one. Another time? I'll play you the same sequence. I could play it 10 times. Oh. Something is missing at the beginning, but it doesn't matter. This is the most complex sequence. These are all the sequences and their complexity according to our language of thought. The point is that whenever there's a regularity, you can remember 16 items. Your memory is not limited to seven plus or minus two, but 16 is way too much if there are no regularities. So at the bottom one, there was no regularity whatsoever. And then you cannot. It's way too much, even the musicians in the audience. Um, you could remember these because they have structure. And this is the sort of structure I'm talking about. Two pairs, four alternations, the whole thing is repeated. Right? That's a sort of tree structure that we can account by a little mental program with four loops, four loops inside, four loops inside, four loops. And it turns out that we could use exactly the same language without modification as the geometry language. All we had to say is, in this case, there are two points. There is A and there is B. Okay. And therefore, it's a bit different from the eight-point situation. But it's simpler. You just stay or you just switch. And it's the same exact structures and the same exact notion of complexity. Uh, the Kolmogorov complexity accounts for the data. For instance, um, we can ask subjects, uh, you're going to hear a sequence, and at some point, there will be a deviant. There will be a B instead of an A, the wrong tone. Or there might even be a completely different tone. Please click. The button and when you ask objects to do this and you can ask for subjective complexity or you can ask for this objective measure of complexity how well how good are they at clicking this is a combination of uh, response times and errors here you can see this beautiful relationship with the proposed measure of complexity the length of the program basically um, sequences that have a short program that are simple are easily detected even for completely out of range sounds c sounds that are never been presented before, you have this sort of relationship uh, of it's more difficult when it's in a complex sequence. And we have been reproducing that in experiment over experiment. There's five experiments in this paper. Um, in this case, we can actually do model selection and show that other proposals. Uh, so this is our proposal, lot, language of thought, complexity with chunking. I will not go into details. But these are other proposals, like change complexity, subsymmetries, lampel zip, which is just compression as a zip file, uh, algorithmic complexity, entropy. We can reject all of these alternatives because they are not as good as accounting for behavior. This is another example uh, from what we did actually in the MRI. You see now the, the miss rate, the number of errors in, in missing the deviant tone is very, very linear. It's rare in psychology to get these sort of nice relationships and also the response time here. Um, and we can do other tasks. We can ask subjects, for instance, can you bracket the sequence for us? Could you put parentheses where you think the chunks are? And you see that what you see in color here is the chunking that subjects put with the boundaries of the chunks. And they roughly correspond to the boundaries that our program predicts. They do not put them always at two or at four. It depends on the structure. And at the bottom, they are very confused, and therefore, they don't get very sharp boundaries. You know? um, so um, 
we can then go to MRI and MEG and study this. And there is, in fact, a very simple prediction. First of all, we have for you, and here this is advertising, there are people with nice animal species like birds or rats, you want to test this. We have this nice hierarchy of sequences that test different levels of uh, understanding. These sequences could be learned just by transition probabilities. After an A comes a B, after a B comes an A. These requires chunking, for instance, pairs, and the transition probabilities are actually completely flat here. Um, these required nested structures, and this can only be solved by pure memory because there is no structure whatsoever. So by asking how far can you go in this hierarchy, we could characterize uh, different animal species in the future. But, and there is a very simple prediction for human. The encoding of the internal model should increase with complexity. It should be harder to remember to encode these sequences until the end where I showed you already before that there should be a drop because we simply cannot code these at all. And conversely, if we present a violation of the sequence, the response to the violation should be larger for the sequences that you can encode and should become smaller and smaller and even absent for sequences that you cannot remember. This is a very simple way to test for memory. So there is a very specific pattern of increasing activation to the standard sequences and decreasing responses to the violations as a function of complexity, which is a parameter that only exists in the head of the subject. Right? It's a consequence of this language of thought. And that's exactly what we found in MRI. You can see all these areas that have this pattern of increasing with a drop at the end for the more complex sequences and then decreasing responses to the deviant. So this is the response to the standard sequence. This is the response to the de deviant tones. And you see this network again, it's not exactly language areas. There is a little bit of overlap. There is a little bit now of superior temporal activation because this is an auditory sequence. And uh, the activation, again, it's not very far from language areas, but it's dorsal to Broca's area, in area 44D, and it's also bilateral, and again involves the intraparietal sulcus at the site which we think is involved in encoding the numbers, the nested numbers that are involved in sequence. So it's also very interesting cerebellar activation that you can see here. And uh, as I said, there is little overlap with language. These are, this is an analysis of language areas, and you can see two of them uh, in the operculum and the posterior superior temporal sulcus that do show a little bit of the pattern, but most of them essentially are not well activated. Whereas if we take the mass network, the responses in the very same subjects localized by doing mathematics, we see that all of these regions contribute very much to this sort of music, minimal music. So we will pursue this in the future, but uh, it may be concluded perhaps that music has more to do with the structure of mathematics than with structures of language natural language. In MEG, we can do the same exact recordings. What's nice is we have now the responses to every single tone, one after the other. And when this tone is part of a regular standard sequence, you can see this beautiful ordering according to our complexity. So the more complex require the most activation because they are not so well predicted basically by the standard model. And conversely, if we do a decoder of the deviant tones, we have this exact opposite order where we have more bigger responses to deviance when they are in a sequence which is easier to understand that has lower complexity. And the responses also get delayed over time. We can actually do this decoder in every single trial and therefore show you the decoding responses to deviance that are presented anywhere in the sequence. So here you can see, and this is a nice way to do single trial analysis and to see that every possible uh, understanding of the sequence is actually uh, respected in this subject. So, for instance, in the pairs where there's no transition probability, they still react to the violations, suggesting that they have captured this aspect of the sequence. And you can see the decreasing decoding performance as a function of complexity. So, we think we have a good handle on sequence memory for visual and auditory stimuli and uh, it requires a language for humans. Um, in this case, we don't have uh, animal data so far. We, we are working on it. Uh, but I want to show you to conclude another bit of data, which is about shapes. We don't need sequences. And in fact, when you see the rectangle in Lascaux, it's not a sequence, it's a shape. So would it be the case that even in this case, humans already encode shapes differently? So let me show you a very simple test. Where is the intruder? Can you see it? So one of them is different, right? Here. And here, it's actually always the same location. It's this one. 
And it's the same amount of displacement. What we do here is we have different shapes and we displace the bottom right corner by the same exact amount for all of these shapes. But as you could see, it's not always so easy to see. And we are going to test all of these shapes that again are more or less compressible because they have more or less degrees of regularity. So rectangles and square are highly regular. They have parallelism, right angles, equal sides and so on. And as we go, in this hierarchy, it becomes less and less regular, basically. And in this way, we discovered with Matthias Sablemeyer for his PhD, a beautiful effect of geometrical regularity, which was not known before, just in behavior. So this is, for instance, your behavior in detecting the outlier for these 11 different shapes. It's super easy to detect outliers among rectangles. It's very hard to detect outliers among irregular shapes, just like the sequences I showed you before. And uh, it's almost monotonic as a function of the number of geometrical regularities. It can be replicated in all sorts of ways, classical visual search, subjective ratings, even if the corners are presented in a sequence, which really shows you that there is something common between sequence and shape in this case. And even if you're not educated, if you're a preschooler or if you are from these uh, people in Namibia, the Himba, uh, who do not have uh, much access to education, so they don't have formal mathematics education, you still see, to some degree, and I'll come back to that, you still see this geometrical regularity effect. It's a bit more irregular in this case. So we claim that this is a geometrical human universal. All humans, uh, according to this uh, high-level claim, uh, immediately pick up this sort of geometrical, uh, geometrical regularities and are helped in all sorts of tasks when they see a rectangle as opposed to seeing an irregular shape. But what about uh, animals? We are very lucky to be able to collaborate with Joel Fago in the south of France, who has this amazing facility where you can test a lot of baboons. They live in semi-freedom, and at any time during the day or during the night, 24 hours, they can enter these booths. You can see multiple uh, booths here. And when they enter, the machine detects which monkey is entering, which baboon is entering, and they have touch screens. And essentially, they get their video game exactly on the same particular trial where they were where they left it. So it's on a voluntary basis that the baboons get tested, but because they love it, uh, apparently, and they get a little bit of food reward, uh, they can get as many as 1,000 behavioral trials per day, which is really extraordinary, on uh, 20 to 30 baboons. Some of them go at 2 in the morning. Uh, surreptitiously, right? they are not high-ranking ones. They go in late at night, but they play their video games. You know, so it's, it's, I think so there is arguments for a parallel with humans there. Um, so you can train them on uh, this outlier detection task with non-geometric stimuli. For instance, pick the outlier here. They click on the screen here. They get a reward. Uh, we actually train them on ten different pairs and each could be the standard or the deviant, and uh, they reach a threshold for understanding the task of doing the outlier detection. And we tested them on another 20 pairs uh, that just to show that they understand the task, the outlier task, right? And once they passed all of these training uh, protocols, there was evidence that they understood the outlier task. We moved them to the geometrical paradigm. And so just to remind you, this is how typical humans look like. Uh, they don't have to be Einstein. They could be in the Himba. They have this geometrical regularity effect. I didn't point out how large the effect is. We're talking about 45% errors here, right? This is not chance, but it's very, very performance, whereas it's very good. So the range of performance is extremely large here. These are the baboons. They are completely flat. There is no correlation with the geometrical regularity. It's a very tough task for them anyway. So they are about 45, sorry, 75% error rate is still better than chance when they start. And then they get better, better as a function of thousands of trials of training. But even as they get better, they don't get differentially better for the regular shapes compared to the irregular ones. Uh, but they don't do nothing at all. They have regularities, in fact, all of the baboons are correlated with each other. So you see this big square here. These are individual baboons for, for whom we have enough data. And you can see that they're all correlated with each other. So they do something which is completely different from all of the humans here. What's the explanation? Well, we can account for the baboon's behavior by a convolutional neural network of the ventral visual pathway, a model of the ventral visual pathway. So when we just feed these images, to a classical CNN like AlexNet, perhaps, 
or cornet, which is supposed to, according to Di Carlo, to be a good model of the ventral visual pathway uh, in non-human primates, we can explain the baboon behavior. It correlates very well. The discrimination by this network correlates with what baboons do. And this is why you have this good predictability by the CNN here for all of the baboons. You can see that for humans, you always need something else. You always need a symbolic model, which just counts the digital symbolic properties of parallelism, right angle, etc., etc. And interestingly, uh, if you look at the himbas and the preschoolers, they require both regressors. So they have a sort of mixture of strategies here. We think that there are two strategies here. You can look at the geometrical shape and process it like a face through your ventral visual pathway, just a shape. And that's what baboons do. But if you are a human, and only if you are a human, you will have a contribution also of this geometrical understanding. And if you attend to it maximally because you've been educated, you get a maximal effect of this geometric model. Um, I will skip, I think, the, the last part of my talk because my time is almost over. But uh, not only can we account for quadrilaterals, this experiment was only on quadrilaterals, but we're trying now to account for all of the shapes that humans throughout cultures throughout the world produce and which have some variety and also some universality. So rows of dots, spirals, zigzags, um, interesting things like a square of circle. I just described to you this very complex picture in a few words, four words, a square of circles. So we designed a program, a sort of computer program that has a language and this language is very simple. It has numbers, one and successor. It has geometry to move and turn and trace a bit like the logo language. And then it has these key control structures, which allow you to repeat a certain number of times, to concatenate two programs, and to call a subprogram and then return, which is crucial to do a circle and return to the main square program. And with these very simple instructions, we can draw all sorts of shapes. And the shapes that we can draw, uh, the simplest one are attested throughout cultures. For instance, a spiral, a dotted line, etc., etc. And as we go higher in complexity, this is the simpler, uh, shortest program, and this is the longest programs. Um, we produce more and more complex shapes that are more and more diverse. We can account to some extent for differences between cultures because the language can be adapted to a specific culture. So if there is a training set of Greek-like figures, like square spirals or square alternations, then we get this sort of uh, productions by the program. And if it's Celtic, Celtic in the training set, then we get this at the output. So we have some adaptation to a specific culture, but the basic shapes are the same. And again, there is a notion of complexity. I just won't have time to explain, but we can test the response time to memorize these shapes and the capacity to remember them properly is determined by the program cost, which is once again the length of the program, the Kolmogorov complexity, the minimal description length. Uh, we can also test some very generic properties. Uh, one interesting aspect of this idea of the length of the program is that you can have very complex figures drawn by very compact programs. For instance, if I look just at the embedding here, if I do a square of circles, so I embed a square in a circle, well, all I need is the complexity of the square program, the complexity of the circle program, and a constant for calling the embed function. It will make the program a bit longer, right? So you have these additive relationships, and we are able to show that human psychology obeys these additive relationships. Uh, we also have imaging in this case, but uh, it's too early to show you, but it seems to fit with the idea that we actually encode this sort of program. So when you see a spiral, you have a very compact program to draw it. So I, I conclude by uh, going back to my hypothesis. I think I've showed you some beginning evidence that we have multiple parallel networks involving different sectors of prefrontal cortex and, as well as attached to different sensory areas as a function of the content, but they all have a capacity for recursive composition. We can recurse with these four loops and nested uh, calls of subprograms. And they all discretize concepts and they assign symbols that compose recursively, even though they have different internal structures. Um, I would like to finally draw attention to two possible consequences of this hypothesis, which are more for uh, human psychology and even uh, sociology. Um, first, I think we can explain here why there is a universal set of shapes patterns, expressions, concepts that we all find simple. 
So we can explain why there is so much cross-cultural convergence. For instance, the spiral is all over the place throughout antiquity and throughout the world. And we can even see the very same spiral in Chartres Cathedral, not so far from here, and in the Dolomites uh, in Val Camonica in Italy, in a prehistoric uh, people who draw this uh, spiral. Uh, or the so-called Pascal Triangle actually existed in China before Pascal. Um, but there is another consequence. The space of possible concepts is enormous. It's exponentially large, the grammar explodes. And this may explain the human capacity to generate infinitely many concepts and to expand the representations. For instance, chimeras, I would argue, are uniquely human. I tell you, it's a snake with seven heads. And that's it. I've given you a very short program for an object that does not exist, but you can picture it. Right? Um, what about the square root of minus one? It's a really interesting formula, which was, this was used in a demonstration against Trump, right? I really like it. Uh, but think of the concept of square root of minus one. It's not really a concept at the beginning. It's barely thinkable, except the expression, the algebra. And then you discover that this is actually a useful mathematical object, and you turn it into something useful in your mathematics. But we can also think of the, the production of various fantasies like uh, religious concepts, perhaps, we could discuss that, uh, as part of the space of expressions that we can have in humans. And I would finally argue that even though these concepts are not coded in natural language, natural language helps, because the space of what we have to learn is so large, we use language to point to what are the concepts that we think are useful in a given culture. So when we teach our children, language is a way to signal to them, catalyze, the learning of specific combinations that are useful given their limited attentional resources. With that, I will close, show you the faces of many of the people who did the work. I think I would really like to insist on Niping Wang, who has this amazing laboratory and capacity to image the thousands of neurons in the monkey brain in awake, trained, behaving monkeys. And uh, thank you all for your, for your attention. Thank you.